you go. Geraldine, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, it's it's my pleasure. And I'm just looking at for your incredible background with the bowls right now. It's absolutely beautiful. And I, and I really look forward to diving into your journey, your topic, and, and why you're so passionate about this. And um, But my first question to you, Geraldine, is if you were at a dinner table right now and you were sat next to a complete stranger and they asked you what you did for a living, how would you describe it these days? <laughs> I used to say to my mom, Mom, what is this? classical singer professor doing now playing crystal acme singing bowls and communicating with her son that's crossed over i must be so weird like <laughs> what am i doing and she'd always say no dear you know you're helping so many people so uh, how do i name it um i'm a musician and i'm a musician that's always been passionate about sound as a medicine sound as a a balsam sound and music as a place to activate love and to move places inside us that are blocked. Um, so I guess I'd say I'm a, I'm a Chris Alchemy singing bowl master alchemist. I'm a professor of music. I'm a singer, um, and I'm passionate about sharing this this very sacred healing sound. Amazing. Do you find that the conversation goes down that direction quite quickly these days, or do you find it remains surface? That's a great question. Um, yes, it does. Because whether it's a doctor, whether it's a cancer patient, whether it's a young person, um, everybody can understand music. Everybody loves music in some form or another. And the sound from the crystal bowls is that, and people are interested. I think people are very uh, curious about how can we take our health and our wholeness, so to speak, really back in our own hands. Like what are the things that we can do? Everybody's heard of mindfulness and meditation and yoga and, um, you know, but what can we do on a daily basis that could help to stabilize us, to help to bring clarity and focus? Can music, can sound really do that? And so they're curious. And I'd say that many people, when they hear the alchemy bowls for the first time, they will either cry, like my, my nephew was just telling me he has a set of bowls and he said he brought them to a retreat and he said on the third day of the retreat, he didn't bring them. And they were all, they were all like, well, where are your bowls? <laughs> bring your bowls back. So I think people are very open and interested in what, what, is, what is it that the sound actually does? You know, why do I feel oh, different man. when I hear that? So yes, very, very much so. I mean, Obviously, there's certain situations where you probably wouldn't wouldn't bring them up, but I I really can't think of anything now. Amazing, yeah, no, absolutely. It's 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 interesting because, like, I was talking to you off air. I've been involved more and more with sound on my journey from my own healing experiences and how powerful that was, and it actually helped me overcome grief. It really opened up my heart in a way I didn't even know that was possible for an ex rugby playing Welshman. You know, it was kind of like, wow, this is, this is incredible. And that really started to make me want to look at the, these many modalities that I think Western society hadn't been looking at, not mainstream, but it definitely feels very more acceptable now and more and more people uh, are leaning into into these modalities, which is amazing. Did you ever imagine you'd be doing what you were doing now when you first started out? I mean, you're a professor of music. That's incredible. And I mean, if I'm not mistaken, you're an operatic singer too. Is that correct? And I mean, you were singing in front of, like, I don't know, tens of thousands of people, I believe. I mean, it's... Yeah. You know, my... my... I knew when I was a young young child that I was going to go into music. I knew, I remember very distinctly um, twirling around on our front patio and singing and moving my body and that it just felt so freeing. And I remember then as a little girl hearing a voice, a vibration, a deeper a connection to God, however you want to name it, that said, freedom, and this this will be your life's journey. So part of me knew that. And, and then when I was 11, I sang a solo in the sixth grade and people said to my parents, you know, what are you going to do? She's talented. And um, my mom ended up, they got a piano 
And um, she said, you know, some things will happen now that may change your life. And um, she took me to a voice teacher and away I went. And I started with a half an hour a week. And then that moved swiftly to an hour. And there it was. And I was on my path. And when I was 19, I, I got my first Broadway contract. So I started in musical theater. I learned all about the great American composers. Um, and my teacher always exposed me to the Italian masters, to German leader, to French art song. And so I, I grew up with a very wide background of music, but always understanding, Guy, that that this instrument is something that um, it's my body, it's me, it's my essence, it's everything that we are. And we all have a voice, whether we sing or not. Um, when you go into that kind of singing, Broadway and then classical music, you have to learn to, you're a singing athlete. You have to train the muscles, you have to train the body so that you're able to project in a 3000 seat theater over a hundred piece orchestra without any microphone. And so I understand it, I understood at quite a young age what it felt that my body was the human instrument. I had these two little vocal cords and I had to learn to, um, come alive inside and light up every cell of me and let the, let that sound vibration travel, you know, and how do you do that? You know, of being an athlete, like, you know, um, you have to train in a certain way and there's a certain kind of uh, discipline and a certain kind of structure. And, and then every different kind of music or piece that you're singing has a whole, has a whole different demand to it. So it's, it's, it was a, a beautiful, wow. beautiful uh, experience to sing all over the world in different languages and uh, be on Broadway and all that. And so, but I never dreamed that I'd be doing what I'm doing now. No. Yeah. <laughs> Just on that, before we, we kind of switch gears in that, like, I, they give me goosebumps you sharing that then, you know, to be able to project your voice and, and in such a large auditorium with thousands of people, like you say, with no microphone. Did you, what does that do when you're learning to project your voice in terms of your own personal confidence and moving forward in life? Because I find that for me, I, I had no voice. Like when I was that age, I was, you know, I was, I'm not the person I am today. I, you know, obviously there's youth and age and things, but I, I never really got shown to follow my passion, follow my, my joys, my loves and, and step into that where it seems that you kind of had that from day dot. You knew what you were going to do. You're out there. What, what was it like growing up with, with these kind of skills? I mean, obviously you don't know where your life is going to go. You know, we never know where our life is going to go, but we have, you know, my, my parents both said to me, you know, the most important thing is to have a dream and whatever that dream may be. My dad sat me down and wrote on his yellow pad and he said, you know, what, what does it cost? What will it cost you to achieve that? What things do you have to do? You know, do you have to practice? Do you have to take dancing lessons? What, what kinds of things do you have to do? And then, so he would say, what's the price you have to pay? And then are you willing to pay that price? Are you willing to leave home? I grew up in California and go across, you know, cross country to New York and everything was a yes. And, and yet, you know, you go to, you train, 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 and then you go to an audition, you have, you know, those 30 seconds or one minute, and you, you have to learn to be so grounded within yourself and to trust that every single one of us has our own unique vibrational signature, you know, just like mm -hmm. every instrument, you know, whether it's a, you have 10 beautiful Steinway pianos in the same concert hall, every single one is going to sound different. You know, and it's important that we understand that as as early as we can in life, that my vibrational signature is my it's my fingerprint. It's my gift. It's my soul's purpose. And I think my parents made that, you know, they made that clear and OK. And I remember one of my main teachers in New York would would always say to me, Geraldine, take the question mark off your back. And it was like, oh, my gosh, like of course there's a question mark there. And of course there's something in your, in your belly that just says, oh, am I good enough? Do I deserve? And there's that little, you know, voice that's always chattering, well, you could have done this. You could have, that could have been better, you know, and especially when I moved into classical music where it's so precision oriented, it's, you know, you have to be a part of a large ensemble with the big orchestra and the conductor and your colleagues. If you're doing, let's say in a Mozart offer, you're doing a sextet, you know, and everybody has to fit and, and, harmonize and intertwine together. So 
there's a kind of precision in that that um, just makes you aware of of so many other things, and yet you've got to be grounded in who you are. And I don't mean like egoic. I just mean you have to have a strong sense of your place in the scheme of things. You know that mm-hmm. your instrument is part of a bigger orchestra, and it's very much needed. And so. I learned at an early age, but I, I, you know, it does take time before you really say, okay, I'm going to let that question mark go, you know, and I'm going to just ground into the truth of who I am as best I can in that moment every day. And, and just really, another thing my parents taught me was to really to, to do what you love and love what you do, you know, and my dad said, if you really love what you do, just go after it with, with all you have. And, and you know it's never going to feel like work, and it, it doesn't. Music is music is such a gift. It's, it's really a great gift, and vibration is a part of everyone's lives, of everyone, you know, of every culture. It certainly is. I love that. Love that. So, from your career, then, I'd love to dive into a little bit because obviously there's, there's been heartache in your life as well, and and a, a pivotal turning point. Do you mind kind of sharing that? part of your journey because obviously it's it's now led you to what you do today and reaching so many people in you know, I, I guess the same way but a different way you know totally different way it's it's really it's your own personal music you know so as a singer I mean I didn't write my own pieces a little a couple of things we've done but um you know you're representing your vehicle I always would say that um, music is love in search of a word is a quote by Sidney uh, Lanier. And, um, you know, that's it. That it. You're always looking to express love through whatever it is. But um, no, I never thought life would, would go the way it's gone. And uh, when I lived in Europe for many years, um, I started a children's foundation. I always felt that it, it's important that Again, music is a language that connects you without having to speak the same language. And living in in Germany, you know, I learned to speak German, but we were in a community that had was represented by forty five nations. So there was many, many different languages. And so I had this inspiration to leave a kind of legacy, and I thought I would live there for the rest of my life. And so I created a, a children's foundation, and uh, the purpose was, to train uh, a group of 15 to 20 children and then write an original musical for them. And then the money that we would raise went to music therapy. So that young person, let's say, who lost a parent or a a sibling was suffering from cancer, whatever it was, could get in a very uncomplicated way, could receive music therapy. And um, Mm -hmm. and then we we supported another group um, led by Peter Maffei, a a German uh, pop star called Tabaluga where they also had about 80 kids that lived in a, in a home and they were using music therapy. So it was something that the kids that we trained could actually see that with their talents, they were helping other children their own ages. And it was, we raised in the end over a couple of hundred thousand euros for this program. And so as a part of it, um, my son who was, uh, he was born and raised in Germany, he was uh, eight when I first brought the Crystal Bowls home. So I was traveling with my mom in the United States and I heard them and I, I fell in love with them. It was as if those bowls made a sound that my soul knew it. it. It knew the song. It knew that vibration. It was so pure and so pristine. And yes, it brings you to tears. It makes you have goosebumps. It's something you, your soul deeply knows. So I bought a set of seven bowls and I brought them back to Germany and I'd play them for the kids in the kids foundation. Uh, When I was teaching them singing, if if a young person had a blockage, I'd ask them to take one of the bowls. Um, So I I started, you know, playing with them uh, as a professor. And, you know, if, if someone had a blockage, I'd ask them to choose one of the seven bowls and each one that I had brought back was a note for the chakras. So there was the root mm-hmm. chakra, the sacral, and up until the crown. So there was a, a C, D, E, F, G, A, and B. And it was phenomenal to me that the blockage would dissipate. They would take one of the bowls and they would uh, mm, they would just hum or tone with it. We would do some of the exercises and the blockage was gone. So um, 
when my son was just turning 13, he was, he was a part of the Kids Foundation and they all entered a, a music contest. And um, every year it was a different instrument and the year he entered it was singing. So he knew the bowls really well. When he was little, he'd always say, mommy, bring me to bed with my sound blanket. You know, and we do little prayers and meditations and he just loved, again, the sound is very, um, it's just comforting. And um, he made it to the semifinals guy. And uh, one week before the semifinals, he came in the room and he said, mom, 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 my voice. And his voice started to drop. And at that point, I had never accompanied a young man through their voice change. So we used the bowls. And um, you can see above me, there's a little yellow bowl. And that was the bowl he loved. And it was citrine. So talking earlier about citrine has to do with activating our personal power our confidence, our self-esteem. And the note happened to be the G note, which is at the throat chakra. His voice stayed open. He was able to do his contest beautifully. And he stood up and said, my name is Dylan. And since one week, I'm no longer a soprano. So he was able to make a joke and sailed into his program. And that was really for me, like seeing my goodness, there's something more Again, I wasn't studied in music therapy or anything like this. We were supporting the, the, the programs that our therapists from the Kids Foundation were implementing. But it was like this really has the ability to go be, beyond what the mind might think, you know, or fears or anxieties. The sound has the ability to take us beyond that, to quiet the mind for however long it does. And then you move into this place of, the sublime, or you move into this place of possibilities that if the mind wasn't stilled by the music, you might never have gotten there. And I watched it time and time again. And so going back, my son passed away. So he was 19 years old and it's go going to be coming up on seven years. And, um, you know, for any parent, it's just, there's, there's no words. You can't believe it's not my life. It's not my child. It's, it's not my destiny. It's just like you, you rebel against everything. And on that night that he died, um, I walked down to the ocean where I live in Southern Cal and California. And I looked up at the sky and there was this huge shooting star that seemed to begin over my parents' home where Dylan and I had been staying and cross the LA basin and land in the mountains behind LA. And I could hear his voice. Mom, mom. You know, it was like that vibration that I heard as a four-year-old. It was just, I could hear his voice. I made it. It's like we always talked about, I'm home. I'm home. I'm with mm -hmm. God. And, you know, that was the beginning of, okay. Like, the beginning of, be not then on that night, but as I trace everything back, he was letting me know on that very night, mom, there's something so much bigger than you and I could ever have imagined in this human form, you know, and I've come to understand with the work of Dr. Sue Mortar, who uh, Dylan led me to her, you know, and which is crazy, but three months in after he had passed away, I just got this kind of knock, knock, knock. And he was a ski racer and a uh, a, a big athlete and we had traveled to many of the places in the world with high peaks and we had gotten to see Mount Everest. We had been in Chamonix in up to uh, in France and we wanted to go to Machu Picchu. So about three months after he passed away, I, I, I heard him, mom, we're going to Machu Picchu. And I, I said, okay. And who are we going with? And I opened the computer and I Googled spiritual journeys to Machu Picchu and Dr. Sue Mortar came up and that's how I met her. And when, when I think about that, because her work and the energy codes changed everything, you know, and I, I had this conversation and I was like, mom, uh, son, don't we want to go with a, the native shaman, you know, a catch one mom, she is the shaman. And, you know, he's having this dialogue with me and that's what happened. I went with Dr. Sue and Everything changed. She took this as his picture and I gave her um, his, this little picture um, on the day that I met her in Cusco and she did a ceremony for him up on the top of Wanapichu, that famous, famous peak. And I was too in grief. I had had a pretty bad breakdown the night before I, and I couldn't 
climb the mountain. There was just no way. So I went on the other side um, and um, she came down the mountain with a small group and she just said, you, ha you have to see this picture. And there's a beam of light that's coming out of his mouth from the heavens. And I saw in that moment, she was crying and I saw in that moment what she was teaching me, we are made of energy. Everything is energy, everything. Everything is sound vibration. There's, it's light, you know, we are energy that gets compressed and compressed and compressed in the human form. And I, I knew that in a certain way, I wouldn't have named it that, um, as a singer, you know, I knew that, that quickening and that feeling of you're so quickened in your core and yet this sound is coming out or this light because you could feel as a musician that there was also a light coming out through your voice. So when I saw that picture and, and began to put two and two together that we really are that and Dylan is that and there is no separation. And there was just so many funny things on that trip. Like he loved um, Tintin. I don't know if you know Tintin and his little dog Snowy, uh, the comic book series, the French comic book series. He collected every single one of those. There's 16 of them. And when I got to my room at the place in, um, in Machu Picchu, my, my room door on it, it said Tintin. And I'm like, what? And I can hear his voice. Well, mom, are we having fun now? You having fun now, mom? Like, so all these different signs and things has, have happened and they continue to happen. We have a relationship now that's beyond what I ever conceived of as a parent. I mean, and I, I understand now through the energy codes that we have a soul contract and that soul contract was, I'm going to go before you and we're going to build a bridge between heaven and earth. And I'm going to, I'm going to help. And we're going to share music in a way that you never thought was possible. Now, when I think about that and I think, oh, son, I never signed that contract with you. And when I see you, I'm going to talk to you about that. You know, he just laughs, but it's like, there's a bridge with sound that is not possible with anything else. I, I think is what I've come to experience. And I am connected with him every single day through that, that sound vibration, whether it's light in, in, you know, whether it's light or whether it's his voice or whether it's just funny things that he does. Um, and that's, you know, it, it's, it's made it palpable. It's made it, um, bearable. It's made it, um, joyous because we're together in a way that we couldn't have been in this human form. You know, mm -hmm. it's not what you, it's not what you wish. You want to see your child grow and have a life and share and all that stuff. But there is a bigger plan for all of us. And if we can remove ourselves and, you know, so like when I'm as, as a musician, I was, a, I was a, a higher soprano. And um, so, you know, singing those very high notes that are really, they feel like they're out of your body, you know, above your head. Um, I know what that is. And so when I play notes that are high, it's opening this portal of light and connection. And yet at the same time, when I play deep notes or when I would sing more grounding notes, you're connecting yourself in this human form. And so when you combine the two of them, there's a bridge between understanding that, as I said, that we're so much bigger than our stories and that um, when we can take that perspective of up here and look at our lives instead of being a victim, everything changes and everything changed in my life. And, you know, when you ask me like, what would I say? You know, what, would I, what would I say at a dinner party or what would I say? You know, I would never have dreamed I would have met Dr. Sue. I would never have dreamed I was playing for Greg Braden and Joe Dispenza and um, Anita Morjani or that, that any of the things Marianne Williamson that have happened have happened. Or now I'm working with a couple of young um, R and B singers, pop singers, and helping them integrate uh, the crystal bowls in their music, and they reach millions and millions of people. It's like he know. laughs, you know. He's just he's like, mom, you know, I, I got to make you cool, you know. And it's like, it's like, son, you know, it's just like we knew when you were little. Like music is that language that 
connects humanity. It touches it heart to heart. And, you know, whether I can say guten tag or bonjour, or I can just say hi, it doesn't matter. Music goes right, you know, right to the essence of who we are. Mm. It's wow. cool. Yeah. That's huge, Geraldine. That's huge. I am. Um... I'm just thinking of the listeners right now as well, because we have people that come through that are, with grief. Grief is very common, obviously, as well. And and I would love your insight because I guess when something like that happens, um, I'm thinking about that. What keeps coming up is you need to feel it to heal it, and and I think it can be so confronting. How do you allow yourself to go there you know because sometimes it can be it's so big you it's know so was big. was it the the because of your sound and your 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 background or was it because you were already open to everything or how, what, what what was it that allowed you to do that i mean it's, it's just beautiful it's such a good question because you know at the beginning i couldn't get out of my bed and the doctor said we I mean a couple of them said let's put you on an antidepressant and i was I was insulted because I was a healthy woman. And it was like, why you put me on a drug and it'll never bring my son back. And I, I knew then that if I don't have the courage to feel the loss and you ask yourself, how in God's name do I ever feel that? You know? Um, but I knew that if I couldn't feel it, just as you said, I could never heal it. I knew instinctively that I had to be able to land in that, but not to, sink into a depression that I never could get out of it. But I knew that if I didn't feel it, it was never going to change. And, you know, I mean, you go through, everyone does, you go through layers and levels of it. But I remember there came one point where after the beam of light and everything with Dr. Sue, where I, I just thought I have to do something. If I don't do something, I'll never, ever get out of my bed. So I called the cancer support community, which is a nationwide organization here that uh, supports cancer patients and their families with uh, alternative methods, whether it's yoga, a kind of um, group therapy, um, music, whatever it is. And I offered to do crystal alchemy sound healing. And I had never led a meditation. I was a singer and a teacher. And I wrote myself a script and I went and it began to change everything because I could sit in a group of people you know, it didn't matter. They knew what grief felt like. They knew what loss felt like, whether they were suffering themselves or a beloved family member was. I felt so safe with them and I began to hone my craft. And there was one moment where I just said to myself, throw your script away. Like just lead the meditation from your heart. And it was just like, you know, and it was, it was such a thing because what was happening there was what I said earlier, music is love. And after those sacred sound sessions with the cancer patients, we would share. And, you know, people said things to me, like one lady said she was a, a traditional meditator for 28 years and had never meditated with sound. And she had stage four cancer. And she said, I, I don't even know how to put this in words, but she said, I'm I'm no longer afraid of death because I've heard the sounds of heaven. And so stuff happened in those groups that transformed my life because I recognized if I could just get that little piece bigger than my own pain and just, again, take that bigger bird's eye view of things, I wasn't sinking in that. And I remember there was a moment where about five months in, after Dylan passed, it's like, knock, knock, you know, mom, call the bold dudes. We're going to do sound healing. And I'm like, leave me alone. I'm grieving you. Like, leave me alone. Mom, call the bold dudes. And it was three days in a row. And finally I sat down and I called the, the crystal tones in, in um, Utah. And I spoke with one of the owners and I said, this is what's happened. And my son is telling me to call you. And so I chose 11 more bowls, guy, and I picked them out according to what, what I thought might connect me to him. Selenite is grounded white light. Rose quartz is for the heart. Ruby is for transformation. Charcoal is for cleansing and clearing. Um, and when those bowls came, celestite connecting to the heavenly realms, 
I started to play those bowls in a way that I hadn't played the other bowls that I had because I sat and I could feel this misty white presence in the room. I could feel my son in the room guiding me. And I started to weep like I'd never allowed myself to weep in, you know, I was in grief therapy in a support group and the words just, they weren't enough. Like you would repeat the same words over and over. You'd tell yourself the story. And if I only had done that, and if that, you know, that could have been, and it's like you would go over and over and over, but nothing changed. You felt like there was a little bandaid here on this part of your heart. But then, you know, the next time you talked about it, the bandaid wasn't there anymore. It was just like, Ugh. but this was the first time that that sound held me and he held me. And I'll never forget keening and screaming and groaning and just letting the grief rip. And I got up to wash my face and there was light in my eyes for the first time. It was like, what? There was a light in there that I hadn't seen in, in months. And I understood, my gosh, okay, the sound is going to create this kind of sacred container and you get to just feel it. And then guess what? After you go in and feel it and groan it or whatever it needs to do, it transforms and you are transformed. And it, it blew my mind because it was so much beyond what talking about anything did. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The... That's incredible. Absolutely incredible. I, I, I think about the moment because it can be so terrifying to allow ourselves to go there because I think we are frightened of what reveals, reveals itself. But at that moment, when you allow yourself to, to truly feel and pass, everything is beyond the mind and it's almost there's, there's a greater depth. There's something beyond the mind that knows exactly what to do if we allow it to happen. And I'm curious to know from that moment on, as you move into what you were doing now more and more, did you just surrender to the whole process or, di or did you get up and go, right, I'm going to start become working with sound? Like, how did it evolve from that point on? I mean, if you can imagine, and of course you can, I know you can, you're so vulnerable when you are in grief and you know, you're still in shock because it's, you still, you pinch yourself and go, it's not my life. And there was one evening where I was laying in bed and it was, it was the middle of the night and I woke up with a start and he was in the room with me. It was like, I could smell him. I could feel him. It was warm. It was like, he was right there with me. And uh, you know, you kind of are in this space between then sleep and being awake, but he had a conversation with me and then I closed my eyes and fell back to sleep. And when I woke up in the morning, I jumped out of the bed and went to his room, sure I was going to find him. And then I sat down on, on his bed and I went, I can't believe how absurd this is. And I looked down at my nightgown and there was a white feather embedded in the threads of my nightgown. And I don't have down pillows. I don't have anything down in my bed. I'm allergic. And I went, oh my gosh, he was there. There was a sign for me from the angels that it's like, so it's not something you can plan. There was no way, like I, I, I did not set out to make a career. I did not, I just had to heal my grief. And I didn't know how, except for by, just the things that began to unfold. So one of my friends, um, I heard him play at a concert. I met him at a concert and he broke me, he broke my heart open. He's a Kirtan singer. He's Australian, Kevin James. And afterwards I went to speak with him and he said, why don't you sit and have, have a, a meal with us? And you know, you're, again, you're so vulnerable because it's just, you're present with that grief all, all, all the time. And then, um, you know, he shared he was leading a, a retreat to India called uh, Heart Songs in the Himalayas. And I went and miracles happened there in, in the Himalayas. And it was like just one step at a time, like just one step forward and following what felt right, what felt healing, what felt true in my heart. 
And on that trip, when I got, when I was flying from uh, Delhi to Leh, and we flew over the Himalayas, I looked out the window and everyone was taking pictures. There was this huge rounded rainbow and I'd never seen a rounded rainbow before. And when I got off the plane and looked at the, the picture that I had taken on my phone, his face was in the middle of it. And it was like, and I found out afterwards that he had, I had had a sound therapy treatment before going on the trip to India. And um, I had just said to the woman, I'm just nervous to go on my own. You know, it was, I had to be brave. He forced me to be brave and go beyond my comfort zone. And she told me afterwards, she said, he said to her in that therapy session, that sound therapy session, I'm going to give my mom an unmistakable sign. And she didn't tell me that. But when I showed her this picture and you can see like his little sunglasses in his face in the middle of the rainbow, it was like all these things, these gifts brought me closer to understanding there is, there is such a bigger picture. And if I'm willing to drop into those feelings that you just, you, you, you think they are impossible to feel because they're so huge. And I had one moment where I thought, you know what? I can't do it. Like, and I would recognize that when I'd get really in grief, I couldn't find him. And then I would, I would, I would be so anxious. It was like, where are you? Why aren't you here? And silence. When I was deep in grief and not able to elevate, elevate myself at all. I couldn't find him. And there was one moment where I, I stood in the room and I, I, I got a knife and I, I put that knife close to my chest. And then I called my mom and I just said, mom, I don't know what to do. I just, I don't know what to do. And she said, if you take your life, I'll kill you first. And that sobered me. I mean, it was just like, God bless my mom. It sobered me in that moment. And I never went there again. And I'm sure for many of the, of the listeners that you have those moments where you just go, God, just take me. I'm done. I, I'm done. It's too big for me in this body. And he taught me it's not, Mom. And to watch the process, to live in the process of just taking one moment of grief and then the next moment of grief and then the next moment and then seeing, oh, wow, that door opened. And then I would get like I got an idea to write to, don't ask me how, I, I just, I have no idea how I did that. But I wrote to Greg Braden. I mean, and and they, you know, and they answered. And so it's like, I would just get these ideas and then I, I would follow them. But they weren't built on, they weren't built on anything else except for, I just have to heal the pain. It's so bad. And then, you know, piece by piece, light came back. And then that light was, sustaining more and more and more and as the light sustains in us we are open to possibilities we're open to truths that when you're sitting in grief you can't find them when you allow yourself i mean again it's the fine line between you need to steep in it you need to feel it but you can't let it take you down and there, there's just that, that line is so fine for all of us. And I remember seeing in the therapy group, um, parents that had lost their children 25 years ago that were still going every day to their graves and were so sad. And I just thought, after I had that miracle with Dr. Sue and the beam of light, I just thought, that's not my path. My boy is here. And love truly is eternal. We just change forms. And if we can, if we can find that, that light. And for me, that was music and sound vibration that led me there. And just listening, like, like, as you asked, like just listening, what's next, but never pushing it because you can't. Because sometimes, as you as you know, like the grief will just overtake you, and then you got to sit down and you got to breathe, you got to ground yourself, you got to feel it, you know. And then I'd sit and play the bulls, and then I'd cry, and then it would pass, and then you get up, and then you do something for the cancer patients, or you, mm. you know, whatever it is. But it's finding those things that somehow uplift your heart, even just that tiny piece so that you don't sink down so deep that you can't get out because then he was never there. 
couldn't find him. So I think for me, that was also the motivation, like, okay, I, I just have to be brave enough to sit in the depth of what nobody wants to sit in. Yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing. It's incredible. Um, yeah, the, the, the two things that stand out for me. One, one thing that as you were sharing then, because I think we all love the idea of being able to just follow our heart more and fall into this surrender and trust that there is something greater beyond us that is with us every step of the way for our greater good and potential. And I think you could ask most people, then they love the idea of believing in that, but whether they, they truly embody it, believe it, and act upon it, uh, you know, they did two very different things. And I guess the question to you is, because I, I even asked you more to this when she came on the podcast last week about, you know, how do you live your life these days? Because you've, you know, you're so established, you've achieved so much. And she said, Guy, I'm just having the time of a life. It's easy. I just keep surrendering and falling into myself. And it just keeps opening up for me. And I'm like, wow, that's just amazing. But they say as well, we often need a wake-up call to truly wake up or to come into that. And I guess my question to you is, thinking of everyone listening, do we need to have the wake-up call to wake up? Or do we? how do we allow ourselves to fully surrender and trust from that, especially if we haven't experienced something beyond the mind yet, or if we're caught in our mind a lot. I don't wish it on anyone. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I just mm -hmm. don't wish it on anyone. And I'm very passionate about teaching. Um, I teach 32 hour trainings, level one, level two, level three. And I have the joy of watching people step into their true vibrational signature. So watching them step into removing the question mark off their back. Mm. Um, that moment where I threw my script away, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to lead a meditation that I'm reading, you know, and hoping that everyone has their eyes closed, but there I am reading my, my meditation script, you know, and I get to watch the students really land in why they're here. You know, and I think everybody has, you know, we come in with the, the things that we need to work through. Some are, as Dr. Sue will say, some are a level 10, some are a level five. But I think everybody has the ability to awaken to their purpose, you know, and to, to if you want to go there to that depth, you know, you may be in a job that you thought you, you trained in, in university and then you took a job. It's just like what you were sharing about your career and you made this incredible uh, protein powder for a particular reason. And suddenly it was like, you know what? That finished and it led you to, your heart was saying, it's time to do this. And the whole joy is, you know, like I was working as a professor at the university and after Dylan passed away, it was like, I can't be around 19 year olds. I can't teach them. I can't, I can't, I can't do it. I just can't do it. And back and forth. I don't, I don't want to leave that kind of situation, but in the end, when you listen to your heart and it's guiding you to move into something else, it, it's, I think it's, it's where we're supposed to be. Um, but it's a very personal journey and I love to hold space for the students to, watch them just, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go that way. And then that opens to that and which opens to that, which that would have never happened if they hadn't have taken that particular risk. And I think life is asking us now, this is what you said, Dr. Sue said, I mean, life is asking us to keep landing deeper inside, especially during this whole time of social isolation and, you know, fear and anxiety and, you know, life that I think everyone's realized life is not going back to the way it was before the pandemic started. And I think we're, we've all gotten used to, okay, what are we, how are we reinventing ourselves and how are we reinventing the way we look at our lives and what's really possible. Uh, and again, I, I didn't start out with any business plan or any, 
anything to do. I just knew I had to find a way to heal the incredible pain that was inside. And that meant listening, a deep listening. And I would invite everyone to find that stillness and to start to listen. And then when you hear that, that voice, even when it's tiny, to just take a step in that direction and follow it. I mean, the worst thing that can happen is you turn around and go in another direction, you know, but if we don't risk, you know, and there was, there was one, one day in the kitchen, I was also in the kitchen and he says to me, mom, we're going to do an online series and it's called the sacred science of sound. And I'm having this argument with him. Well, wait a minute, the sacred science of sound, that doesn't make sense. It should be the science of sacred sound. No, mom, it's called the sacred science of sound. And this is who you're going to invite. You're going to invite Deborah Primal and Mitten. You're going to invite Greg Braden. You're going to invite Anita Marjan. You're going to invite Dr. Sue. And, you know, this whole list came down and I'm like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> you made me into a sound healer, but I'm not going to be an interviewer. And it was like, yes, mom. So begin. And then that was 2, 217, 218. That whole thing unfolded. And it was it was free. It was um and and the idea really from from him through me was to bring together all different aspects from scientists and musicians, um, all different kinds of professional people. But what is the intersection of excuse me, of um science, spirituality, the healing power of music, sound vibration? Where do all those intersect for all of us? And what what do they ignite in each of us? And that that was how it started. And it's it's gone on. It's very much, um, very, very much alive now. We did a, another event in 2020 and then a, a, a live event before COVID in 2019. And we had a season this last year and more younger people have come in. And it's it's just really fun to explore what is that that connects us? What connects us? Hmm. And how can we each empower our own selves with vibration? You know, whether it's um, tuning forks, whether it's gong, whether it's dancing, um, singing, um, learning about the biofield, learning about the chakra system, whatever it is where you, you take that information and you say, wow. I can integrate a little bit of this and, and that. And then suddenly you're, you're getting those inspirations where suddenly you, you want to try this and you want to try that. And I think for all of us, it's, it's so important now to not be in the box because life has shown us we can't. And your question, you know, life shook me to the core. It was a 10, you know, but not everyone needs the 10 mm -hmm. and it's, what's my path? What's my special path? And, you know, what do I need to wake up? So I guess it's really, it's really the desire, you know, how deep do you want to go? And when you get struck with a debilitating disease or um, a death or whatever it is, then of course life forces you. But if that's not the case, what inspires you? What lights you up? Um, what's the, what's the deeper little voice that's just kind of knock, knock, knocking. And does everyone want to hear that? I don't know. What do you think? I I, th I think more and more people definitely want to hear it, and they're they're starting to ask deeper questions. I mean, that's what's happening here in Australia, one hundred percent. And again, thank you for sharing all that. It's just wonderful listening to you. And I, um, I just want to share with the listeners. That's how I discovered you. Somebody shared, "Hey, guy, check this out," because people send me things all the time, for guests for podcasts and all sorts, you know. And back in 2017, when you launched that, um, I I was sitting there and I watched, I probably watched half of them, at least I came through as they were coming through each day. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. So, and I've been subscribed to your newsletter ever since. So it's it's been amazing how the power of the internet and these these moments in time can bring people together, even though they don't know each other. You know, and I'm always fascinated by that, even putting a podcast out, like I've been doing this podcast, let it in for four years. I think your episode 205. I mean, I just show up weekly and I and I put them out and I've had the pleasure of speaking to all the people you've mentioned as well over my time. And it's for me, it feels like a privilege to have these conversations every week and to be able to share them and put them out there into the world because podcasts help me along my way 
before I started podcasting as well. And and I always wonder, I go, wow, who's listening on the end of this right now? I don't know where they are in the world. I don't know what their life circumstances are, but I know people are listening because I can check the, st the statistics on the other end, you know? And so there's, there's something magical for me in that as well, even though I'd love to meet everyone in person at some stage to go, oh yeah, right, got it, you know, and, and have that human connection as well. But it is, yeah, it's a fascinating time we live in. Fascinating time. I think it's, it's important what you said, like when I had that moment through the script away, like it's really important to trust that you bring everything you need. Of course, we want to be prepared. And certainly as a classical musician, everything just had to be prepared to, you know, down to the last. But I've learned that improvisation and just simply showing up and being present and being fully in your core and fully yourself, that's it. And it's like, I felt immediately when I saw your face, it was like, oh, I've known him forever. You know, it's just, it's this, there's wonder and there's surprise and there's joy. And I think as much as my life had a lot of joy and a lot of fulfillment in it before, this is a whole nother thing. It's because you're living right in the actual, you, you can't plan, you can't. Um, and when you, when you can live like that, Miracles and magic happen mm. all the time. Sherilyn, you're an inspiration. You truly are. And I, I just thank you for everything you, you've shared with us today. And I'm aware of the time of the podcast. And, and you did mention off air that you would happily play the bowls for a few a few minutes before we ended the show. Would you be happy to do that now? And maybe explain yes. a little bit about what you're about to play. Sure. So I always ask before a conversation like this, which bowls want to play? So there's over 500 bowls here in the studio. And um, wow. I, I'm very wow. blessed to have all these loving orchestra members, and then I can combine them in, in many different ways. So I'll just play you this part so you'll hear this. talked about this is what we would call um, a chakra set okay so it's working with the root chakra up to the crown but then these notes go above the head and then these notes go below the body so we're working with the sound being something that's deeply grounding centering us but also accelerating us and opening us to expand. But the importance is these, these bowls are made of pure quartz. And so quartz is incredibly grounding. And quartz is something in its cellular structure that's similar to our bones. It's similar to our cellular structure. So the sound is received very easily. And often people will just, you know, they suddenly are focusing on, you know, what's this beautiful sound? And then suddenly you're diving into those places where for me it was grief and there were big pockets of that pain that suddenly when I would hear this sound, my mind focused so intensely on the beauty of that, that the grief could start to feel and reveal and then it would dissipate. So there's all kinds of alchemies. The, the pure quartz is then infused with, uh, like for example, that's rose quartz. This has gold in it and Lemurian seed. This has emerald. Um, this is another kind of gold that's pink. Um, this is a, a stone called Super 7. Um, this is Celestite. This was one of the first bowls that I, that I got to connect me with my son. So I put together this set and I would say it's, it's a lot about the heart. It's a lot about transformation and transmutation with the St. Germain, St. Germain, and there's some St. Germain in that. And that's really about transforming whatever it is in each of us that needs to, to shift. And, you know, at the beginning, I thought, come on. I mean, really, this is, there's, this is some woo woo stuff, right? And you can see my face. I mean, it's, it's not been woo woo over here. And that's, what's so fun to combine this with 
the bioenergetics of the energy codes and Dr. Sue's work and really understand what is that science behind the sound and what does it mean when you hear this. And then I invite you to take a long deep breath. You know, and how does that feel? So I'll invite you all to do that, to take a long deep breath and deep in your belly. And I invite you to simply tune into, is there anything up for you right now that you would like to transform? And setting a personal intention for yourself, allowing the sacred intervals the sound to hold you steady. And long deep breaths. And allow your personal intention of what you are wanting to transform or heal to be very present now. release and let that go. And allow yourself to receive the sacred sound. Our sound vibration energy light in human form allowing the sound to take us beyond words even beyond human touch to the place of infinite possibilities.
And gently rubbing your palms together to generate heat. Just feel that heat, that electric energy in your hands. And then you can gently place them on your heart and your belly. Connect that with your breath. Ah, sigh and use your voice. And then gently begin to tap your chest, your belly, your hips, your thighs. And stretching. And that was a very mini, mini, mini session of healing sounds. Thank you so much, Geraldine. That was beautiful. And, uh, I, I recommend everyone, if they were listening to this on audio, to jump across to the YouTube channel and, and have a look at the, the 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 bowls and everything that you're doing and what you have behind you. It's absolutely stunning. It truly is. And uh, that's a beautiful way to finish a podcast, Geraldine. Thank you so much. And um, I, I always ask one question um, before we leave, and that is, with everything we cover today, is there anything you'd like to leave our listeners to ponder on? The vibrational frequency of love. How does that feel in your own body? Mm. When you are being loved, feeling loved, Expressing love, how does it feel? And then repeat, breathe and repeat. Hmm. And in that is, is joy and healing. Beautiful. For anyone wanting to learn more about your work, Geraldine, what you do, what you, your offerings, um, the link will be in the show notes, but it's always great to say it out loud as well. Where can people go to find out more about you? Crystal Cadence is the website with everything about music and trainings and the bowls, if they're interested in bowls. And then Sacred Science of Sound offers different things. Uh, we've had masterclass series. Um, so you can look at sacredsciencesound.com also. And our YouTube channel. Crystal Cadence YouTube channel has all kinds of free meditations on it. That was another thing Dylan was very, very insistent upon. Mom, we got to build a YouTube channel and there has to be music available for everybody, wherever they are in the world. All they need is an internet connection. And so we made um, two two-hour loops. Oh. So you can use those two-hour loops to study when you're cooking, when you're just relaxing going to sleep. Uh, there's two different loops. One is uh, working with an endocrine system and one is working with the chakra system. And there's all kinds of s songs, of so bowls with music. Um, but that's a great resource there at the YouTube channel too. Amazing. Geraldine, thank you so much for coming on today. I, I loved every minute of our conversation and you just radiate so much joy and peace. It's just a pleasure to have you on the show and uh yeah just thank you for everything you're doing and and thank you for being here today thank you for the invitation and ditto to you thank you for following your heart and sharing all these incredible conversations with the world mm. thank you mm -hmm.